Good evening, everyone. I, Kamakshi Vasan, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Academic Programs, Tirotama Foundation, welcome you all today to this special session on cultural diplomacy, present and future scenario as a part of the ongoing international diploma course on diplomacy and foreign policy at the Tilotama Foundation. The Lothama Foundation works globally in the areas of international relations, diplomacy, area studies, gender, environmental, scientific, strategic, and defense policy. I would firstly like to thank Mr. Soham Das, Chairperson and Director of the Lothama Foundation for his generous support and encouragement throughout the course of the ongoing international diploma course on diplomacy and Indian foreign policy. Cultural diplomacy is a crucial aspect of international relations as it provides a platform for countries to showcase their unique cultural heritage and promote mutual understanding and respect between nations. With the increasing globalization and interconnectedness of the world, cultural diplomacy has become even more relevant today as it can facilitate peaceful coexistence and cooperation among nations. It can also be a source of economic benefit for a country by helping to attract foreign investment and tourist inflow. This makes it a strategic tool for enhancing international cooperation and promoting understanding and understanding between different cultures. The global perspective is another fundamental aspect of international relations. It provides us with a glimpse of how other nations perceive us and what issues they are concerned about. This enables us to better understand the world around us and to anticipate the ways in which other countries are likely to interact with us in the future. Moreover, cultural diplomacy is also being used to address global challenges such as climate change, poverty, and terrorism. For instance, UNESCO's International Jazz Day is celebrated on April 30th every year to promote peace, dialogue, and cooperation among people of different cultures and backgrounds. Cultural diplomacy has emerged as an important tool for countries to achieve their foreign policy objectives and promote their national interests. In terms of future trends, I believe that cultural diplomacy will play an important role in shaping the global landscape in the years to come. Cultural diplomacy will continue to be used to foster greater understanding among countries and people around the world. In a world where cultural differences and conflicts are becoming increasingly pronounced, cultural diplomacy can play a key role in promoting peace, understanding, and cooperation among nations. With the rapid advancement of technology, cultural diplomacy is likely to become even more important in the future. Online platforms such as social media can be used to promote cultural exchange and collaboration. Moreover, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the importance of cultural diplomacy in times of crisis. Countries have used cultural diplomacy to promote solidarity and support each other during the pandemic. For example, India's Vaccine Maitri initiative provided vaccines to several countries to help them combat the pandemic. This initiative helped India enhance its soft power and promote its national image. Lastly, I believe that international relations is an extremely complex and dynamic field that requires constant attention. I'm sure our speaker for today's talk will talk in de detail about this. I'm sure that we will have an interesting discussion. I am pleased to welcome our distinguished speaker for today, Ambassador Dr. Gaudi Shankar Gupta, former Deputy Permanent Representative of India to UNESCO and former High Commissioner of India. He is also Distinguished Advisor, Foreign Affairs and Environmental, Spiritual and Cultural Studies at the Tilotama Foundation. Thank you, Ambassador Gupta, for being here today to speak on this multi-faceted subject of international relations. I'm sure you will give us a very interesting talk about the various facets of cultural diplomacy in today's challenging and ever-changing world. I'm keen to hear your views on this important subject. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this special lecture on a very timely topic, cultural diplomacy, present and future scenario. I hope we will get to hear some great insights and have a productive discussion. With this, I would now like to request Ambassador Dr. Gauri Shankar Gupta to start with this presentation. Over to you, Ambassador Gupta. First of all, thank you very much, Dr. Kamakshi Vasan. 
you have been very active in the foundation. You have worked very hard uh, to achieve different objectives of the Lotoma Foundation. And I feel delighted to be part of this great organization. I also extend my warm welcome to all those who are attending today's talk. I'm sure you are great learners and you are looking forward to some new tips. I hope I'll be able to satisfy your, uh, uh, your curiosity and your you know, desire to learn. So let's start. Now, what is diplomacy? You see, diplomacy can be divided primarily into four parts. One, traditionally what diplomacy has been is diplomacy based on political relations between the two countries. That was the traditional way we looked at diplomacy. Even when I joined diplomatic service way back in 81, this was one of the primary areas of diplomacy. But then slowly, slowly new uh, you know, dimensions of diplomacy have come up. We know the uh, economic diplomacy, which has become very important today uh, because the economic interest of a nation have become predominant. And if you are economically prosperous, if your country's GDP is higher, if your per capita income is good, then obviously you, know, you have a strength in pursuing economic diplomacy. Then in fact, today's world, we also have something called military diplomacy. Now you know the military objectives uh, uh, are not forgotten, though after the Second World War, we saw uh, somewhat you know, lull in military diplomacy, but it is again there. Uh, in many parts of the world, we have seen conflicts and military diplomacy is basically the diplomacy of war and peace. That how to bring peace in areas which are affected by war or which are likely to be affected by war. But the most comprehensive diplomacy is actually cultural diplomacy. This world cultural diplomacy is very comprehensive and I, I will try to explain it in, in detail. I remember I when I was in UNESCO, uh, UNESCO organized a conference on culture and development. It was held in, uh, in Stockholm and there was an attempt to define what is culture. And despite so many you know, great minds putting together their heads, they could not really come out with a precise definition of culture. So the culture is a very comprehensive term. Uh, let me try to you know, spell out the dimensions of culture. If we can't reach a definition, let us at least understand the dimensions. You know, the culture starts with the, the language used because the first thing a child, when he is brought up, he starts speaking. So the language you speak, the variety of food you eat, what kind of food you eat, uh, you know, it, it depends on different cultures. Then what kind of clothing you wear? Then what are your festivities? What are your, you know, traditions in the society? For example, even the custom of marriage, how you marry, uh, what kind of ceremonies are held in marriage. These are all part of cultural diplomacy. Not only that, the stories you tell to your children and grandchildren, that is also part of your cultural you know, heritage. So the cultural heritage is a very vast uh, you know, subject which covers practically each aspect of your life. The day-to-day -day life, uh, which you spent uh, from early morning till late in the evening is part of your cultural traditions. So it is not so easy to define cultural diplomacy in that sense, but yes, there are certain uh, very outstanding features. And I would like to talk about India's cultural diplomacy before we go into other topics, you know, uh, concerning that. Uh, great subject. Now, you see, if you look at the history of India, uh, most people, most historians would agree that India has a record of not attacking militarily any country in the world uh, ever since 
you know the known what you call the written history of the world is available so india has that tradition it has been invaded by others it has defended itself sometimes it has failed to defend but it has a history of not attacking any country but still the influence of india has gone far and wide if you go to southeast asia you will find indian cultural influence in every facet of their life whether it is their religious traditions whether temples whether their language for example bhasha indonesia has its origin in sanskrit malaysian language has its origin in sanskrit their food habits their uh, you know religious habits in the past have their tradition in indian practices you go to central asia a large number of practices in central asia were based on indian traditions whether they were hinduist tradition or buddhist traditions or jainism to some extent so you can spread your cultural influence despite you know being a totally non violent nation despite uh, a, a practice of not attack attacking any other country and subjugating them by force so this is the uh, you know advantage of cultural diplomacy that you don't invade anybody you don't create bloodshed and you are still able to influence the thought process of the people and cultural diplomacy is a long lasting process it doesn't last for a few years because the territories which you acquire by force you can retain them for a few years maybe for a few decades sometimes maybe for a century but it cannot last very long ultimately you have to give it up but cultural diplomacy if you look at it it can last for millennia like indian cultural diplomacy in southeast asia and central asia has lasted for over 2000 years now so let us have a look at india and its cultural uh, dimensions now not because i am an indian and uh, i might have some you know prejudice it's possible but i have also traveled more than 100 countries in the world i have seen civilizations with very close uh, eyes uh, i have been to islamic nations i have been to christian countries i have been to countries which do not follow any religious traditions uh, i have been to countries which are you know uh, nomadic in nature like mongolia so i have traveled far and wide in different parts of the world and seen their cultural heritage their cultural uh, what you call you know uh, the traditions which are followed and i can proudly say with all that experience that india is a uniquely placed country in that respect let me give you a few example to start with if you look at the most ancient scriptures written anywhere in the world they are called the vedas rig veda is considered the oldest written text anywhere in the world this is accepted by all the scholars in the world so that is the you know contribution of india that vedas vedas basically means knowledge it is a compilation of knowledge uh, gained and written down by various sages who lived in different times in the past a ved is a sanskrit word with it its root is with with means to know to knowledge like in india we also say vidya vidyalay vidya path vidyarthi the word comes from vid the all basically meaning related to knowledge now that is one aspect then you go further down upanishads are practically part of vedas but they are considered separately by many scholars in the world and they have the deepest knowledge you can imagine anywhere in the world and this has been acknowledged by scholars all around the world you name the great scholars of any country and they have acknowledged that veda the, the upanishads contain the deepest knowledge ever uh, you know put together by human minds and this is 
the knowledge which tells you what is this universe, how this universe came into being, how this universe is managed, who manages this universe. If somebody created it, then who created that person who created this uh, universe? Uh, who am I? Why I have come into this world? What is the purpose of my life? So we are talking about issues which are, uh, you know, far reaching issues, which have consequences, not only for human being, but for the entire existence. And those have been discussed in Upanishads. Upanishads are 108 in number, but 11 of them are considered most important. And all of them basically uh, give this profound knowledge that who we are, what is this universe, how it came into being. There's a very, uh, some of the openings start with a very profound sentence saying that, what is that knowledge? By knowing that, that everything else is known. And that is what the Upanishads start with. The, the students ask the teacher. The, the teacher is you know, telling them the knowledge. By knowing that particular thing, you know everything in the world. So that kind of teaching has come into Upanishads. And this has been acknowledged all over the world. Then if you look at the universities around the world, uh, if you look at the most ancient universities, uh, if, if my memory and my knowledge serves me right, Takshila, which, was, which is approximately 2,800 years old university, it is no longer in existence, but it was in existence for more than 1,200, 1,500 years. That university was the oldest in the world known to mankind. And then there were universities like Nalanda, Takshila, and there were many more about 40 old universities in India, which existed uh, between AD 0 and up to 14, 1500 AD. And these are the oldest university systems anywhere in the world. The recent universities which came into UK and USA are only say, three, four hundred, five hundred years old. But these universities which I'm talking about are almost 2,700 year old. So that is the university system. And now when the Nalanda University was burned down by an invader called Bhakti R. Kilji, there are writings uh, there in, uh, of that time that the library of the university kept burning for more than three months the amount of books and literature which was contained in those libraries was unbelievable. The dimension of that literature was unbelievable. So you can imagine the heritage that was contained in those books and which has been lost because of these uh, uh, you know, invaders who put the, those universities to fire. Then if you look at, uh, say, some of the other oldest writings, we have two epics in India called Ramayana and Mahabharata. Now they are the epics which define India in every aspect of life. Now Ramayana is an epic based on a story where the ideal human conduct has been shown in the form of Rama. Ram is uh, the king of Ayodhya and his conduct as son, as father, as husband, as ruler, as brother, uh, you know, and as friend has been depicted in this epic and what can be the most ideal form of human conduct has been shown there. This is an ideal situation where we can, you know, advance our conduct to that level if we try to do so. So it sets a very higher level of standard to which humans can reach. Then we have another, you know, scripture or, uh, you know, epic called Mahabharat. Now Mahabharat is an epic, uh, which you will not believe, is such a large epic, which has never been uh, even 
10 epics of any civilization put together do not reach that length. It has more than 100,000 Sanskrit verses and it is woven in storage and storage and storage. Even a part of that uh, Mahabharat you know, uh, epic can become a big uh, book in itself. And this epic deals with all types of human conditions. What is wrong? What is right? What we should do in a given situation? Uh, there are different uh, arguments given by different uh, you know, actors in that epic who justify their behavior based on their understanding of what is right and what is wrong. I have never seen anywhere in the world a writing of that nature which deals with the best in the human civilization, worst in the human civilization, and defines what we should do and how we should do. So that kind of uh, writing uh, is incomparable. I consider this as one of the mandatory reading for any person if he wants to understand uh, the human civilization. And that is why it is said about Mahabharata that whatever is contained in this world is contained in that epic, but whatever is not contained in that epic does not exist anywhere. The human mind goes there. They talk about great missiles. They talk about airplanes. They talk about you know, genetic uh, uh, codes. They talk about uh, how we can do... Uh, you know, the chemical and genetic reforms, how we can create uh, new weapon systems, what kind of prosperity could exist, how the human relations should conduct, all kinds of, all possible options have been defined there. So that is a part of human uh, civilization. Of course, it is part of India's heritage, but it is also a part of the human civilization as a whole. Then if we look at some other aspects, for example, uh, we talk about health sciences. If you, of course, the, the modern health sciences, which are basically based on the research done in the last say, 100, 150 years, they are very recent. But if you go to the history of health sciences, uh, you go to the book called Susit Samhaita or Charak Samhaita, they were written almost 2000, 2500 years back in time. And those books contain, you know, what you call refined detailed about human body, human uh, functioning of human, uh, various organs of human body and how human body can be cured through natural systems. There are references of skull uh, what you call surgery uh, way back 2000 years ago and variety of other health uh, uh, you know problems have been dealt with uh, in these scriptures in these health writings i do not find anywhere in the world writings older than those on health sciences and those writings are still valid in fact today i was looking at uh, some whatsapp messages uh, by a very famous doctor in US. But I also read a book uh, <coughs> some, a few years ago about uh, human health. It was published in US based on a research conducted by some professional doctors. Now those doctors told in that uh, you know, research paper that about two thirds of the total diseases we have today, they are because of the side effects of the medications taken by a person in the past. So can you imagine the side effects of the medications? The two thirds of the illnesses today are because of those regions. And Ayurveda is one science where there's no side effect. It is based on regulating your food habits, your exercise, your sleep, and a little bit of input of herbal medications. 
there is absolutely no side effect i am one person who follow that system of medication and i have never faced any serious health issue so far and i have not been to any hospitalization i can claim it myself and i you know follow yogic practice some i do some yoga as i do some uh, uh, pranayam and i follow healthy diet as per ayurvedic prescriptions and that is the way the human life should be rather than getting into chemical so this is another example of the heritage cultural heritage of india uh, which uh, our ancestors gave to the world then if we look at for example uh, economics and public policy or political science i know the oldest book on this subject was written by a person called chanakya or kotilya uh, that this gentleman was uh, uh, you know the chief advisor of chandragupta maurya a ruler who existed in the 4th century bc that is approximately 2500 years back in time and this guy wrote a book called arthashastra and that arthashastra is the oldest written book on political science as well as on economics and diplomacy i know of there is no book older than that anywhere then if even if you look at uh, you know the romance and sexual uh, practices the oldest book on the subject is also written in india which is called kamsutra which was written almost 2400 years back in time okay? even in uh, in the form of you, you call natya shastra that is the dances and music and uh, you know the the cultural activities which we understand generally in in cultural sense even that book natya shastra was written in india almost 2000 years back in time so that is the kind of heritage india had back in time uh, whether it is uh, you know scriptures whether it is right and wrong whether it is human conduct whether it is human conditions whether it is health sciences whether it is uh, dance and drama and uh, music in all these areas or of course education india has a great heritage and on top of it there is another great heritage which i consider the language sanskrit now sanskrit to my knowledge is the oldest language anywhere in the world some people say that tamil is equally old maybe that is true i don't know but any case both the languages are of indian origin tamil and sanskrit now sanskrit has given birth to approximately 460 languages around the world i have created a dictionary of my own where i can tell you more than 500 english words french words and spanish words which come directly from sanskrit not only that uh, there are a lot of scholars who have written like max muller has written that the origin of german language is lies in sanskrit and i know i have studied french little bit the uh, the french conjugations they are practically based on sanskrit uh, you know uh, grammar so that is another thing which india has given a large number of european languages that is why it is called a group of indo european languages then uh, another great tradition of india has been astrology and mathematics now astronomy astrology and mathematics if you go back in indian houses you will find the janam patri based on navgraha is prepared for times in memorial you can go back to generations and generations uh, at least 50 100 generations you will find that navgraha and janam patri were known to them now what is navgraha navgraha is the nine planets in the solar system and uh, there is a book called surya siddhant which i accessed through a library in california 
Uh, and the translation of that book was done by some British uh, person called Bruger or Bruger, how they spell it. It was uh, written in 1700 some years. And you would not believe you can access this book called Surya Siddhant on internet. That gentleman has himself prepared a table there, not only one, there are multiple tables, which tell you very clearly that what is the duration of the, uh, the, the rotation of sun on its axis or all the other nine planets on their axis. Precise timings have been given and you will be you know, totally fascinated to know that a book of 2,500 years old gives that precise timing of that, uh, the, the astrological facts. And I will tell you some of those timings right now. Uh, this is 144. I have that in one of my books here. So, I have quoted that table in this book, which I have written recently. Now, this Surya Siddhan, there are another book called Surya Siddhan Ceremony in India. They tell the sun's rotation. It says 365 days. Six hours, 12 minutes, and 36.6 seconds. That is what uh, Surya Siddhan says. And modern science says 365 days, six hours, nine minutes, 10.8 seconds. Now you can see the precision. Uh, I still have a feeling that Surya Siddhant may be closer to the truth, but in any case, there's a difference only of uh, less than three minutes in the entire calculation. If you look at Mercury, for example, it says 87 days, 23 hours, 16 minutes and 22.3 seconds. And modern science says 87 days, 23 hours, 15 minutes and 43.9 seconds. So it is practically the same. And I, their own, all the nine planets have been given here with the, that kind of uh, precise data. And this is not, I am not quoting this uh, from my side. I can tell you the page number and the name of the book, which is here. It was published, it's called Surya Siddhant by Ebnezer Burgess published by the Journal of American Oriental Society, volume six. And this is page number 141 to 498. And this can be accessed, there's a URL on which it can be accessed. So that is the kind of precision India provided. So the Indian heritage, cultural heritage, was extremely vast, incomparable to any heritage in the world. Even if you look at gastronomical, the, the food we eat, the Indian food varieties are so vast that every 50 kilometers you'll find a totally different variety of food. And with vast usage of spices, which are designed based on the, you know, seasonal fruits and vegetables, which are good for human health, which was designed, in fact, all those things are now coming back because people are getting fed up uh, with the uh, chemical intake of the modern medication, the intrusive nature of uh, the, you know, the, the what you call surges, not only surgery, but also the diagnosis, which is very intrusive, and then the side effects of all that. So people are slowly, slowly realizing. I realized that in Europe when I was uh, posted in Hungary and France, that more and, more and more people are becoming vegetarian and they are going back to the natural diet. They, they are reducing their uh, you know, food intake from fast food chains and they are preparing more at home. 
at least a section of the society. So all these things are based on a wisdom uh, which is very, very universal. Now, why I'm saying all that? I'm saying all that because these are the heritage of a nation which will have a lasting impact on any diplomatic effort. If today the, we are celebrating International Day of Yoga, if we are celebrating International Day of Nonviolence, eh, these are basically based on the Indian heritage. Similarly, I'm sure that a day will come when we will celebrate an International Day of Ayurveda because that will become uh, the sign of good health. Eh? That will become an essential requirement of good health. And the day might come that we might celebrate an international day of Upanishads because that gives you the most profound knowledge on that. So all that is very important. I have done it in my uh, diplomatic career. I have delivered a lot of talks on these issues around the world. And people have shown tremendous curiosity and interest to know about them. And more and more people uh, are becoming aware about Indian heritage. And for example, these days, the India is chairing the G20 uh, you know, uh, group of nations. And the meetings which are being held are spread over in more than 56 cities in the country. And that has been designed to tell the foreigners to experience different India and different parts of the world. Because India has such a diverse culture, despite being a common thread of uh, you know, uh, heritage, the culture of India within the country is extremely diverse. If you travel from Bengal to Delhi, to Haryana, to Maharashtra, you will experience a very vast difference in cultural practices, in food habits, in clothing habits. They may all be wearing sari, but very different style of sari. They may be eating all vegetarian food, but very different style of vegetarian food. They may be having same type of classical ragas based on the traditional Indian ragas, but uh, the final outcome of music will be very different. So all this is because if you have a common thread, which is deeply rooted in your civilization, then it is easy to talk about that thread. And that is what you will experience more so in, uh, in Southeast Asia. You go to Indonesia, you go to Cam Cambodia, you go to Vietnam, you go to Laos, you go to Thailand, you go to, for example, in Thailand, the, the Thai language is based on Sanskrit. The king of Thailand is named Ram, Ram 1, Ram 2. Now, now I think he's Ram 10 right now. So, you know, the, the Indian civilizational influence, even if you go to South Korea, they trace their ancestry to Ayodhya. In fact, the, the former princes of South Korea had come to India a few years ago and she visited Ayodhya because she traces her ancestry in Ayodhya. So these are some of the facets of the cultural heritage, which can be talked about in terms of cultural diplomacy. This is, we call it soft power because we are not talking about military dimensions, but the soft power is more important. Like the software, you put certain things on software, it can travel very fast and very wide. While if you take a hard print and send it to different parts of the world, it will take a lot of time, energy, and money to send it that way. So the soft power goes very fast and hard power takes its own time. With hard power, you can only reach the borders and not far, but with soft power, you can transcend all the borders anywhere in the world. So this is the power of uh, uh, cultural diplomacy. So I think I would uh, stop here uh, primarily because I have given you a, a very wide spectrum of things, how the soft power can be used and what uh, uh, you know, the, the, the penetration of that power could be very deep, not only within the country, but in different civilizations of the world. And that is how, if you realize that even country like China were dominated by the soft power of India, which gave, which went there in the form of Buddhism, 
In Mongolia, it went in the form of Buddhism. And the language of, for example, Russia and all the Slavic languages were influenced tremendously by Sanskrit. European languages were influenced tremendously by Sanskrit. You go to a small country like Lithuania today, and you will find tremendous influence of Indian culture. So these are the roots. And even in the modern time, uh, let me give you this <laughs> example before I close. Columbus went around the world. He wanted to go to India, but he ended up somewhere else. Why he wanted to come to India? Because India was the richest country in the world at that time. You know from uh, year zero, from the Christian uh, you know, counting of time, year zero up to 1720, India was the most dominant economy in the world, controlling somewhere between 35 and 30% 30 of the global trade and global production. And it was the richest country in the world. And this was one of the regions uh, people were looking for trade routes to India. And Columbus was looking for a sea route for it from India. Now he, by mistake, he took a wrong direction and went to the Latin American side and he went ended up in the Caribbean. And he, he thought that this was India and he named them as Indians. So even today, the West Indies is known as West Indies because Columbus thought that they were Indians. And then he, the name was changed to West Indies because the India is here, that is East India, and that is the India in the West. Similarly, the Americans were, the, the original people of America were also called Indians because Columbus thought that this, this is India. This whole part was India. And therefore, he called them Indians. So even today, they are called Indians. Uh, so you see the influence of India was so deep because of multiple facets. The knowledge, the economy, the non-violent nature, the language, the, the scriptures like Ramayana, Mahabharata, uh, Upanishads, the educational institutions like Taksila and Alanda, the health sciences, the, the, the ability of dances, the architectural styles, all these things influenced the world as a whole. Uh, but after the, what we call industrial revolution in Europe, India's dominance became less and less. And then we were also uh, colonized by the British and then our economy went down. You know, our traditions changed, but now slowly, slowly, India is again picking up. It has become the fifth largest economy in nominal term, third largest in PPP terms. And India's influence is now felt all over again. So this is what cultural diplomacy can do without any military use, without any use uh, attacking any country. If you can influence the mind of the people, you can do that only through cultural diplomacy. And that diplomacy includes all facets of life. It is knowledge, it is food, it is clothing, it is you know the ideas, it is the customs, traditions, all that which can influence a human being and his ideas. So this is what cultural diplomacy can do. I consider it a most important part of diplomacy of any nation. So I will stop here. And if you have any questions, I will be uh, delighted to answer. I'll do my best. I don't know whether I'll be able to answer all of them, but I'll do my best. Thank you so much, uh, Kamakshi. It has been a pleasure again. Uh, meeting you and meeting with all of you, the great uh, students from different parts of India and the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Gupta, for your interpretive address on this very interesting topic. Your insights into the role of cultural diplomacy in promoting understanding and cooperation among nations were truly inspiring and thought-provoking. Your presentation was a valuable contribution to our understanding of this important field and the potential it holds for promoting peace and prosperity. Thank you for providing an overview of the principles and practices of cultural diplomacy, as well as several examples of countries who use cultural diplomacy as a tool. For example, Central Asia and Southeast Asia 
have made substantial use of cultural diplomacy to promote understanding among different communities within their regions in order to build peace and stability through the use of cultural diplomacy. While such initiatives have been very successful in many parts of the world, they need to be further promoted and expanded so that they can be used more effectively to promote peace and understanding between different cultures and religions around the world. India, since ancient times, has been instrumental in promoting cultural exchange and cultural diplomacy to its rich and diverse cultures and people. Whether it be through Vedas, hymns, or mantras, India has always promoted unity through its diversity. Ramayana and Mahabharata are examples of this. These stories tell the stories of how Rama and his followers undertook an epic journey to rescue Sita. The role of Hanuman and Lakshman, and along with them, the Vanar Sena, how they participated in the battle is of great significance. The story tells us the importance of human bonds and how love transcends all the differences in religious and cultural differences in life. These two stories tell us about the importance of harmonious relationships and how to fight injustice with love. This ancient philosophy has greatly benefited many nations around the world through our various contributions. Over the years, our, our active engagement in promoting cultural exchange has resulted in establishing many exchanges between India and other countries. Ayurveda is one such contribution that brought together people from different cultures to learn and understand one another. Through this, we understood the natural way of living to fight against diseases and improve the standard of living for the common people. India had one of the best scholars, poets, writers, and artists in the world. For example, we have had dignitaries through the course of time like Kabir, Shankaracharya, Chanakya, Kautilya, Tulsi Das, Valmiki, Valmiki Aryabhatta, Ramindranath Tagore, A.R. Ambedkar, and others. They paved the way for spreading Indian culture across the world. Thanks to these masters, Indian culture and art can be seen in many museums, art galleries, libraries, and even in the villages and countryside. Besides this, we also promoted education in our country through different approaches such as public lectures, debate competitions, and school visits by dignitaries. Gurukul was one such approach that emphasized the importance of human resource development and encouraged students to embrace new ideas and technologies to develop themselves. G20 is also an example of our commitment to development. With constant meetings being held, India aims to highlight Indian culture and promote the interest of our country as a whole. It was very informative to learn about the different ways in which cultural diplomacy can be used to promote peace and friendship among different peoples and to foster understanding and tolerance among different groups within the society. I commend your thoughts and observations on this very important topic and look forward to hearing from you in our next segment of question and answers. Thank you once again. Now let's take some questions. So first question we have, how can cultural diplomacy be used to address global challenges such as climate change, poverty, and conflict? And what role can cultural institutions play in these efforts? Actually, this is a very interesting question that how we can use cultural diplomacy in climate change, reduction of poverty. I think this is fascinating. I can speak for a very long time on this issue, but I will try to uh, be very precise and concise in my answers. You see in India, for example, you have a cultural heritage where the whole universe is considered as one single entity, impacting like a human body. Human body, every my hand is not separate from my mind. When I, before I think of something immediately, my hand and my, you know, parts of the body start acting according to the thinking in the mind. Yeah, the food is nourished somewhere else and it is sent in all parts of the body to nourish every single organ of the body. So the body is one single entity operating together. You cannot say my hands are different and my legs are different and my eyes are different and my you know, uh, feet are different. It is not possible. Similarly, we have visualized this universe as one single entity where everything depends on everything else. For example, this, the sun. The sun is uh, approximately what? Two, three billion kilometers away from Earth. I don't know precisely the distance, but it is very, very far away from Earth. 
it impacts every part of our life the day begins with the sun the day ends with the sun with the sun energy our food is digested with the sun we we are able to see the world uh, the sea the, the sun determines the body temperature uh, whether we are sick or not the sun provides fertility to the earth and that is why we have the crops the sun rules the the cycle of rain for example the uh, the water vapor goes up from the sun rays from the sky and then the winds blow them away and then it comes back again with condensation process so all this the whole you know activities in this world they are interconnected so that is what have, has been taught in indian culture and that is what we should look at now the concept of exploiting nature which came into the west in the last century is the most dangerous concept you cannot exploit your mother for example nature the air you breathe comes from your nature the water you drink comes from your nature the food you eat comes from your nature the habitation you live in comes from your nature whatever you consume in your daily life comes from nature and still you are trying to exploit that nature now this is a total disregard to the to the environment and that is why we are in trouble today because we started exploiting the nature because of our greed now the greed is the cause for that and exploitation it means we are considering nature as a separate entity and us as a separate entity and we have the right to exploit and that is why all the problems of environmental degradation have come into existence and this is precisely the region i wrote this book uh, this is titled limits of consumption environmental degradation and ancient wisdom now the ancient wisdom here is basically that the whole uh, entity the whole universe in which we live it is interconnected they are not there's nothing to be exploited we are also part of it it's like a car having a tire and an engine and a seat and if you say that i will try to exploit the tires then the car will not run tomorrow because you will exploit the tire tires will get bust and be finished so this is how the we are interconnected today in the western world they call it oneness the new term has come into being it is called oneness in india which was always known as one single entity which having different aspects of life you know totally interconnected so if we look at the environment then if you look at the world as one interconnected entity then the environmental degradation will not happen then we will you know respect the earth we will respect the water bodies we will not create uh, the, you know waste uh, which is not biologically degradable then we will not exploit the minerals to a to a limit where we will not find any minerals and metals after a few years so all that will stop automatically so it will depend how you look at and the philosophy of life so this is about the environment poverty now you see poverty is a curse if you don't get uh, uh, to meet your basic needs the basic needs of your food your habitation water health should be met but then beyond that there is no limit there are desires of humans today who want to own houses in different continents who want to have 20 different cars they want to have private jets they want to have helicopters they want to have yachts they even want to have a house on moon and they want to have a satellite which can take them to moon now that kind of lifestyle uh, is naturally going to cause problems if you have one person like many studies have shown that practically 3% population of the world owns about 60 to 70% of total resources this is what we have come to this is because of the human greed this is because of uh, uh, no control over desires you keep expanding your desire desires are totally elastic and they will they are they, they actually grow in geometric progression 2 to 4 to 8 to you know 
64 like that and then you get into the trap so you have to learn the right way of living this is what the indian sages told us that depend you have to draw from the nature only what is required to fulfill your needs not your desires in fact there is a upanishad called isa vasya upanishad the very first verse of that upanishad starts with that that you should only draw only as much from the nature as you need because the desires are infinite they are ever expanding you can never satisfy so that is how we can tackle the problem of poverty and uh, we can create a society which is not so unequal we cannot be completely equal that is not possible but we don't have to be so much unequal either where only 2 3 percent of the people of the world own uh, 60 percent 70 percent of the total resources so these are problems which we can tackle if we can address them in the cultural context and if we can learn something about our own you know existence that why have come in this world who am i what is the purpose of my life if we can understand those fundamental questions these problems will disappear so that is what i would like to say in response to this question thank you master gupta moving on to the next question is it possible to enhance the prioritization of cultural diplomacy over political and military diplomacy you see political and military diplomacy are confined to a very small time frame and a small segment for example the military diplomacy between russia and ukraine now you cannot have that diplomacy all over the world it's not possible how much military can you expand all over how many political conflicts you can have so those are limited things and in fact those things can be tackled through cultural diplomacy for example today russia ukraine war there is another question on that or palestine and israeli question now if you look at the history of their cultural assimilation russia and ukraine are very close culturally they have been part of a similar civilization if you bring them together on that basis the people of the two country would not like to kill each other there is no way they would like to kill each other because they speak similar language they live in similar traditions they have a similar history of coexistence they have lived together for centuries why should they kill each other but this is what has happened same is the case in israel and palestine when you politicize certain things or if you add some external element then you become enemy of each other now israel and palestine they they belong to the same land they have same cultural you know evolution the same history they have lived together for centuries perhaps millennia and now they have a conflict based on religion now a religion has been added there as a part of that if you bring them on cultural grounds the people will like to live peacefully with each other so the cultural diplomacy actually can resolve provided we are able to eliminate the uh, what we call religious or political aspect out of that conflict and that is what we should try to minimize let's build the public opinion uh, against such conflicts through the cultural uh, evolution cultural teachings so that you know we can resolve these conflicts Thank you, Master Gupta. As you mentioned about uh, your Russia-Ukraine case and also Israel, uh, Israel and Palestine uh, case, we have a question based on that. Uh, what, according to you, are the reasons for the failure of diplomacy to resolve conflicts, as observed in cases such as Russia-Ukraine and Israel-Palestine disputes? Listen, if you look at the history of wars, go back in back in time anywhere. ultimately the wars are resolved only through dialogue you look at the most recent second world war such a devastation so many countries were involved but the war did not solve the problem ultimately they had to sit together on a table and talk and resolve that issue there was no other way out the same thing happened with the first world war the same thing happened with war between any two countries anywhere 
like for example india and pakistan we have lot of conflicts there are lot of you know problems since the partition of the country but do you think the war can resolve them no ultimately the two countries will have to sit together on a on across the table and resolve those issues there is no other option because by killing people by eliminating a section of the society uh, or by using the weapons how long can you do that if you use for example nuclear weapon you will kill billions of people maybe 3 4 billion people are killed then what what happens nothing ultimately you have to again come back on the table and negotiate and talk so military option is not an option in my view at all this option should be completely kept aside and that is what india did throughout its history the military option should be kept aside this is only reserved for a very very emergency special case otherwise we should resolve the disputes through dialogue if the if the russia and ukraine had sat together across the table say <laughs> more than a year back this would not have resulted in to killing of i don't know half a million people i don't know there are different figures in both sides maybe half a million people have been killed maybe a few million people have been displaced and millions of people are passing through tremendous hardship all this could have been avoided but these wars are happening because of what i tell you what one single reason ego of the leadership the leadership gets into the ego mode and then the wars happen they bring the entire nation into the war because of their ego and that is what has happens if you go to the history of war this is what you will find in most cases the practical reasons uh, to resolve the war the practical solutions to resolve the war actually lie in dialogue in talks and based on uh, you know the, the the affinity of culture because most of these wars are in the neighboring states and neighboring states have similarity of culture their traditions are same like india and pakistan we have similar cultural traditions we have same civilizational values but the wars happen because an outside factor religion or something else or some arms dealer want to get into the process or some third country wants to take advantage of the situation then you get into the wars otherwise you can sit together and resolve and that is what i feel that cultural diplomacy is extremely important and i'm sure the india will uh, try to play at least you know they will try to use cultural diplomacy to resolve the ukraine russia conflict in the in the coming months i hope it works and it will be in the interest of every everybody because um, the preconditions and the ego will not bring an end to this war and no humiliation of any country will uh, will bring an end to the war because the humiliation will uh, will require a revenge and that will may take a few years but it will come back so that is not a solution either thank you master gupta um, next question is based on g20 uh, what steps can india take through its g20 presidency to establish itself as a vishwa guru or a global leader listen i personally don't uh, want to use this word vishwa guru uh, you know first we have to in india itself today there was another question that indians themselves are moving closer to the western mores these days which is considerably true i can find a large number of people in india adopting the western lifestyle particularly the middle class and higher middle class people they are all uh, finding a mad race in the western system and then they 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 are neither you know true indian nor true western and they are suspended in the middle somewhere this is what has happened and i don't want to use this word with guru because we every civilization has its values okay they have certain uh, uh, what you call principles guiding principles of that civilization 
So we should use those guiding principles of each civilization. When we negotiate things, uh, we cannot use Indian knowledge to negotiate between Russia and Ukraine. It has to be the local knowledge, local uh, principles of peace which have to be uh, developed between the two countries. Similarly, if there's a war between, for example, Palestine and Israel, there are certain local value systems which should be used. India can help uh, through you know, the cultural diplomacy at a, at a larger level. But India, in my view, this word Vishwaguru will give a wrong notion that India is guiding the uh, civilizational values around the world, which is not uh, the impression I want to give. We have our values, yes, which are very important, which have played an important role in India's history, but other civilizations also have their values. And we can you know, have a sort of uh, uh, coordination or a sort of a smooth collaboration between different value systems in the world to bring peace in the world. And that is what I look at and we would like to say in terms of G20, India can play three, four major, uh, and I think they're trying to play three, four major uh, important agendas. One of them is to highlight the role or the problems of the global South. That the countries of the South, which are uh, you know, not so well endowed in terms of resources today, need to be taken on board. They lack finances, they lack energy, there's a problem of poverty in these countries, and we have to look at that. That is one. The second is the environmental issue, which we can look at. And we can say that based on the Indian civilizational values, we should look at the entire universe as one single entity. We cannot go on exploiting the nature as we have been doing in the last, say, almost 80, 100 years. This will lead to multiple problems and therefore we should come down on the so-called GDP parameters of income or wealth. You know that GDP parameters only is one of the parameters of uh, human growth. And in my view, this is not a right parameter. The parameters should be like that what uh, Bhutan has developed, the holistic approach to happiness. And that should be the parameter where income plays role, but limited role. Health plays another role. Education plays another role. The human thinking by why you know human being uh, wants to be dominating the whole world that should also be thought because we are also one of the uh, you know living species there are so many species living in the world we should allow them to live why we, we don't have a right to you know kill and uh, you know destroy other species of life that should also be thought in the way and that is the way I think the environmental issues can be tackled by India. Then the third age, the issues concerning economic growth. You see the disparity of income, what we call in economics, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the income distribution is not proper. That distribution of income and wealth should be somewhat labeled. And that is possible only when we transfer technology to the poorer nations. When we allow certain investments in the poorer countries, new industries uh, should be set up in the southern nations and they should be given help to preserve their natural resources like rivers, eh, like uh, uh, you know forests, eh, like animal wealth then only things can improve. So that is the third element that how economic redistribution of income and wealth could be done through transfer of technology and through transfer of investments to different parts of the world. I think that should be another uh, element where India can help. The fourth thing where India can help is to not to resolve, but to prevent conflicts in the coming years. 
you see prevention is better than cure once a conflict has come into existence then it has so many manifestations like one year ago uh, before the war started between ukraine and russia it would have been easier to handle the situation but after the war started with so many sanctions so many weapons so many countries coming into picture so many other issues coming into play the things have become more and more complicated and it has become more difficult to tackle that issue so prevention is better so india can play a role in in areas where there is a potential for wars in the future and that is where india can say that let us give more space to diplomacy in those areas of the world there are many areas in the world where there are potential conflicts uh, mostly in africa some in middle east also some in latin america and a few in asia i think those are the areas where uh, india can say let us uh, prevent the future conflicts those are likely to take place whether it is the question in myanmar for example or whether it is uh, the issue in 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 some of the latin american countries for example in brazil the situation is somewhat changing in peru there are things which are in place in mexico which are also you know heating up a few things so all these things can be tackled in in the stage when they are not a full blown conflict within the country or against another country so prevention is one issue where we should play a role and i think these are the four areas i would identify uh, the 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 environmental issues the issues of preventing the conflicts the economic disparity and uh, you know the the overall i think one more area i would like to say the strengthening of the un bodies i think the un bodies have be have become very weak now these united nations was formed in 45 after the second world war the structure is based on those realities the realities have changed and therefore the un is not able to play important role i think if we want to play the un an important role we have to restructure the un we have to redefine the veto power and include countries which are uh, dominant in today's era so that the the decisions could be effective and they could be implemented effectively so these are the four five areas where i think uh, india should play an important role in guiding the uh, you know the path of g20 thank you ambassador gupta um, next question is as you talked about western culture so despite the increasing recognition of indian culture and its significance in life why are indians gravitating more towards western culture i also want to comment one uh, aspect to this through the course of time we have also seen this opposite scenario we have seen westerners been more fascinated by the indian culture i can name few people like julia roberts mark zuckerberg steve jobs these people have shared their immense love for indian culture and you know so would you uh, can you please just highlight both of these aspects thank you so much you see if uh, let me go a little bit into detail of this issue you see what is visible what is tangible attracts you more uh, this is the nature of human existence we have five senses we have our ears our eyes our skin for touch we have our nostrils and we have our uh, taste the, the, the our tongue now whatever is possible to grasp through these five senses attracts us most if you hear something attract your ear immediately but if there is a total silence it will not attract you if you see somebody sitting in front of you you will be feel attracted but if the person disappears goes away you forget about him so this is that way the human senses are designed to act whatever visible whatever is tangible whatever is sensible attracts you most things which are not visible not tangible they don't attract in the western culture the things are visible they teach you what what we call the american dream 
you should have a big house you should have a car and you should have good clothing you should go and eat in different restaurants you know this is the type of culture they teach you okay? you go to restaurants you go to nightlife and all that now that attracts you if you are on the superficial level of life if you go deep down in your life if you understand the subtle nature of life then these things will not attract you then you become deeper for example when you look at the ocean you only see the waves on the ocean you don't see the ocean at all but if you go deep down into the ocean you find so much variety of life there you find tremendous you know amazing things there but you never reach there you see very few people reach there this is the nature so we are all the time governed by our sensible world this is what we call sensible or intelligible world if you go down the beyond the senses then you will find the reality for example you see a tree you only see the you know the the leaves and the branches and the fruits and uh, you know the flowers and all that but you know why the tree is surviving because of the roots which are not visible to you the roots are the one which are nourishing that whole thing if you cut those roots the tree is finished you see that you go to a house somebody's house you see oh beautiful drawing room dining room this kitchen you know bedroom all that but you don't know how they are surviving because of the foundation if you remove the foundation all that will collapse so the invisible part of life is the foundation and unfortunately in india because of the colonial rule because of i don't know whatever the regions are we have forgotten that invisible part now we are only looking to that visible sensible part and we find very attractive that the western style thing and that is why the so called uh, you know middle and higher upper middle class in india are getting attracted to the uh, western culture the rural people still are deeper in their sense they are not so much attracted to the, this culture because they live deeper life they live life closer to the nature and once you are living a life closer to the nature you will ignore all these things now we live in apartments we don't even see the moon and the uh, you know stars uh, uh, we don't even feel the heat and the cold outside the the people living in the rural areas who live in the farm house or in in their farms work in their farms uh, they realize all that so if you are closer to the nature you are uh, feeling the what we call invisible power of nature and that is what is missing today and that is why the more and more uh, indians are turning to western culture but sooner or later uh, the cycle will be over and they will have to come back to the roots you know uh, let me give you another example you can body beautify your body you can you know go to a makeup place and put all kinds of makeup you can do your hair dressing you can change your clothing you can appear fantastic you can sit in a very nice car you look modern appear to great person but can you change your sleep the sleep will come as it comes can you change your hunger you will feel hungry like anybody else and you will not change your emotions they will come out as they come so you know we forget those essential parts of life and we get into this uh, into a picture which is projecting ourselves it's a it's a facade which we put up on ourselves in different different ways that facade has become more important these days with social media you go i went to this restaurant who oh, i wore this kind of dress you know, i went to travel there and this and they put and then people feel attracted some people feel jealous and they, they want to do the same thing so that has become this is a facade which we have created in in sanskrit or hindi they call it mukhota we wear this mukhota the real face is inside which is hidden and outside you put a face 
and this is what is happening uh, in in india these days the education is not uh, good for them because they don't go deep into the education they only learn the superficial part of it and they never understand who they are what is the purpose of life and they they are guided by these uh, you know things which are visible and tangible the deeper knowledge is you know in everything comes from in sanskrit we called it avyakt se vyakt hoti har cheez everything comes from uh, non manifest to manifest i am speaking now how i am speaking these words are coming from some power which is non manifest in myself that power is there in everybody and those words are manifest but the power inside is not visible to you that's not manifest similarly the power in the earth is not visible which gives fertility to the earth and which brings the crops out you can see the crops but can you feel that power which gives that uh, you know fertility to the crop the crops come up why we don't see the seed we don't see the power which brings the seed into fructification that is the problem and that is happening because we are uh, you know becoming more exhibitionist we want to show off there is a tremendous competition to show off and that is why people are becoming western but then their whole their life becomes very hollow after a while and they start feeling a vacuum that has happened in west i have been to many countries in the world the people feel hollowness after 50 years of life they have traveled all around the world they have dressed in best places they have eaten in best places they have consumed all kinds of foods and then they feel why where we are going what should we do and they reach a stage where there is no direction of the life they become totally hollow and that realization comes perhaps too late for them only after 50 55 or 60 years of age i think it's better to realize that now so that we can direct our life in a more meaningful way rather than just becoming uh, you know putting a mukhota and showing to the world that this is what i am that mukhota should be stopped we should come out with our natural uh, you know uh, appearance and we should be natural human being as we are thank you master gupta for answering the question also commenting uh, on my uh, you know question uh, next question we have is although cultural diplomacy is a vital component of promoting peace and serving national interests can it effectively replace political and military measures in managing time time sensitive situations such as de escalating conflicts in militarily charged zones like kashmir and eastern europe is military diplomacy and political influence not necessary in countering china's expansion in the asia pacific region you see the military and political diplomacy also have their role in short term when a conflict is taking place you have to bring it down politically and militarily but once it has subsided then the cultural diplomacy should play its role the cultural diplomacy can prevent that conflict to happen it can play a preventive role but if it happens for certain regions then you have to use political and military diplomacy to diffuse it to a to a level where the cultural diplomacy can take place because cultural diplomacy cannot happen when people are using missiles firing on each other if they are you know using tanks and missiles and aircraft to attack each other you cannot use cultural diplomacy you have to first diffuse it and bring it to a level where you can talk and use the cultural diplomacy so the political uh, diplomacy and military diplomacy have a role to play when the situation needs to be diffused so the cultural diplomacy has two roles first the preventive role that situation should not reach a point where you have a conflict but if it reaches then it can play a role only after the situation has been diffused to some extent that it can play that role so in between Uh, as you call it you know the life saving part is played in certain ways by the military and political diplomacy to diffuse that crisis 
like a disease goes up to a, a point where it will take your life. So you have to diffuse that. There you use strong medications for a while. Once it has come back to normal, then you use you know food and exercise to resolve the practical uh, other issues. So that is how the cultural diplomacy can help, uh, and political and military diplomacy also have their. Thank you, Master Gupta. Uh, moving on to the next question: How can Ayurveda contribute to strengthening India's soft power and global influence? I'm telling you that remember my words from 20 to 25 years from today. Ayurveda and yoga will come back as a part of human life on daily basis. Because people, I've seen in many parts of Europe, people are completely fed up with chemical intake of medicines, which is causing one problem after another because you, they don't cure the disease. They only cure the symptoms. You see all these medicines which you take today, they cure your symptoms. For example, if you have fever. Now fever is not a disease. The disease is something else which has caused fever. Fever is a symptom. If you are coughing, the coughing has been caused by some underlying region in the body. So you have to strengthen the body's immunity because the biggest doctor is the body itself. It actually takes care of all the illnesses practically on a daily basis. You ask a scientist, he will tell you that millions of attacks are happening on human body every single day. Millions, not thousands, millions. There are so many bacteria which are invading your body. And those are defended by the immune system you have inside. For example, if I get a cut on my finger here, now what happens? The blood starts flowing out. Now, what does body do? The first thing body does is to create a, a, a sort of thicken the blood here so that the blood stops flowing out. The first thing they do, it happens automatically because body takes care of it. Body is a very living being. There's a doctor inside. It immediately thickens the blood. The, the white cells start operating. The blood starts thickening and the blood bleeding stops. If body doesn't do anything, the bleeding will continue forever and you will die. There's no way. I, nothing can be done. So that is done by the body. Then slowly, slowly, uh, the body brings a new skin. The new skin takes place of the old skin. It is removed, it happens automatically. You don't do it. it. It is not done from outside. The whole thing grows from inside. So the immune system of the body has to be strengthened. And that can be strengthened only through four or five things. The one is the food you eat. The food is the one which makes your blood, which makes your bones, which makes your flesh. It converts into all that. What is your body? Body is made of the food you eat. So if you eat a poor quality food, obviously your body would be made of poor quality. The garbage in, garbage out. So if you eat good quality food, your body will be of higher immunity. It will have that uh, you know, sustainable immunity which can fight against diseases, illnesses. So that is the first thing, good food. Secondly, the digestive system has to be good. That is why tremendous uh, you know, emphasis has been given on keeping a good digestive system in Ayurveda. There are treatments given only for digestive system to keep it in good shape. The waste disposal should be proper. If the waste is not disposed, then obviously it will cause a lot of problems inside the body. The food you are eating should be digested and all the juices should flow in different you know, parts of the body. So that is the the fundamental engine of the body. Then rest. You see, a good sleep in the night is essential. And the best sleep comes between, say, 10.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning. It is guided by the nature. It is not guided. During that period of sleep, the whole energy of the body is diverted inside and it cleans up and repairs the entire body. 
for example in the morning you feel to evacuate because in the night the system has cleaned up everything and you feel like evacuating evacuating in the eyes you develop you have some you know something comes out why because in the night it has been cleaned and you in the nostril something come out yeah? in the on the skin you find some skin thing has come out when you take your shower you find that something is coming all this happens in the night time when the body repairs itself and also uh, you know replaces where replacement is needed if we do not give good time to the body to do that then you cannot repair the systems and one disease will lead to another so good sleep in the night is very important and the best sleep of the night is the time when after sunset you know it's sun is regulating our life so when sun is also in deep sleep from our point of view it's also tells us that you should also be in deep sleep, deep sleep. and that is the time so that is the second aspect or third aspect the first is the food second is the digestive system third is the sleep fourth is you know uh, the shram or the the work we do with the body you the body is designed in such a way that you cannot keep sitting all day if you keep sitting all day all your muscles and various you know systems will not work properly it has been designed that you should put in some labor you should walk you should work in fields or you should you know lift some weight or you should do certain things it's not the gym exercise it's the regular daily life where you will you know perform certain activities which will give exercise to the body to keep all the muscles and all the veins and all the systems in order that is very important so that is the another aspect of the body and the the last aspect i would say is yoga and breathing exercise breath is the one which regulates our pranic energy you know there are type of pranic energy in the body i don't want to go into detail of that but that energy for example if i feel life here why do i feel life here there is some prana which is flowing there some vital energy which is flowing here so the vital energy covers every single cell of the body and that flow is regulated through pranic energy if we do not regulate that pranic energy that flow becomes imbalanced certain areas get Uh, do not get enough oxygen we can call it modern sense they are not getting enough oxygen and they are not regenerated and that is why the body uh, you know starts getting illnesses or ailments so all these four five things if we regulate properly uh, the food the food should be fresh it should be seasonal don't use uh, you know things which are non seasonal uh, they are very poisonous they are dangerous today what happens today happens that in india now it is hot season this somewhere else it cold season the cold fruits come from there and you eat them that is not meant for your body here you should use use local fruits which are you know grown in that season local vegetables that is the way the the whole system is designed in the nature so the the fresh food seasonal fruit and uh, in in you know not too much quantity not too little quantity it should be balanced food that is one part then you should keep track of your digestive system earlier we used to have these upwas and vrat periodically you don't eat once a month or twice a month that is to give rest to the digestive system and also to take some uh, you know some medication to clean the uh, body waste uh, we used to call them it's you know used to call them julap for example here people used to take that medication to clean all the body waste so that is very important uh, to to keep the digestive system in order third is uh, you know uh, exercise you should do good sleep you should take four five and then you should do yoga and pranic exercise yoga is very important to keep flexibility of the body you can use gym for lot of muscles and all that but gym is not good for flexibility of the body the flexibility of body comes from yoga so that is very important so i think these are the elements which will come back to uh, life 
And remember, 20, 25 years from today, you will see Ayurveda back in full bank, with full bank. Thank you, Master Gupta. Um, moving on to the next question. In terms of cultural influence, besides spirituality and healing practices, what other aspects does Indian culture have to offer to the world? Oh, I told you many things today. One is the holistic thing, that whole universe is interdependent. So don't isolate. If you want to live in harmony with nature, then only you can survive and you can be happy. You cannot live in conflict with nature. So that is one aspect. It is not a spirituality. It is the concept of living. That is one part. Secondly, you should draw from the nature only as much as you need because desires are infinite. This is not a spirituality. This is a science. The desires are infinite. I know people who have millions of rupees in their bank account, but they cannot spend two rupees for a cup of tea. I know many people like that, not one. I know several people like that. You ask them to pay poor people 10 rupees, he will refuse to pay. But he will buy a big car for 50 lakh rupees for himself. You saw a YouTube video recently that people were taking away the a person who owns a car which was bought for 50 lakh rupees. He is taking away ports from the G20 meeting of, you know, floor ports and plant ports, uh, stealing and taking away in that car. So that is the kind of mentality we have. This happens because uh, we do not understand what is life. So that is not a spirituality. It's a, uh, a science of living. You can call it uh, science how to live in life. So the greed should be avoided. How to live a life should be learned. A holistic approach in life. These are some of the things which are nothing to do with the spirituality. These are totally what we call spirituality today. Uh, you know, you understand by spirituality doing good for others. That is what you mean, isn't it? You're looking at philanthropic activities. Now that is also not spirituality in that sense. If you do good to the others, the good will come to you also. I have experienced this in my life. If you are nice to others, others will be nice to you. You love a child, the child will come to you again and again. If you look with you know very sharp eyes with the child, he will never look at you back. So this is a natural principle of life, to live a life. So spirituality is not uh, something in the air. It is the deepest science which you can understand only when you go into those details. You should do what is right and what is wrong. You should not do what is wrong. Because ultimately, the, in, in India, we say the truth always will prevail. Truth will always prevail, which happens in every part of life. Those people who misuse their authority, those people who accumulate wealth, ultimately, they will find you know, their place in prisons at some sooner or later. You've seen that in variety. And if it is not... Uh, you know, the justice system in the world is not perfect. In the human world, it's not perfect. So if it doesn't happen now, it will happen in your next life. The nature will give you that punishment. That is why some people are, you know, born as poor and some people are born as rich. Some people are born without, you know, proper uh, body structure. Some people are born with full body structure. This is not accidental. There's nothing accidental in this world. Everything is a return of what you have done. So that deepest principle of life we have to learn. It is not a spirituality. It is the deepest science. Even the law of Newton tells you something. It's not me I'm telling you. The law of Newton tells you the same thing. So I think these are uh, the things which we have to learn. Uh, living life with proper understanding that who am I? Like the other day I was delivering a talk uh, how to live a life. Just uh, this Sunday, last Sunday. And, you know, people have to understand. Now you spend so much time on understanding. For example, you buy a new cell phone today. You will spend hours to understand how it operates. All the systems and then you will upload or download whatever 
you know the applications and this and that and make it workable it will take uh, at least a week to make it properly functional isn't it is that true now do you spend even a few minutes to understanding the most complex system ever created in this world which is the human being there is no system more complex and more elaborate and more scientific than the human being is do we ever spend even 15 minutes on this who am i how i work what is this we don't so we can have a session on this come back someday but you know this is the spirituality is not something in the air it is the deepest science it's the science of all sciences and therefore we should understand the interdependence of the whole cosmos it works together there's one thing we get what we give to the world so we should give good things good things will come to you you know if we learn these two things in cultural uh, context i think that's good enough to make our life uh, better than what we are today thank you for sharing your great insights on this question ambassador gupta um, next question is Uh, is it possible that cultural diplomacy could result in the cultural dominance of a particular culture you see the cultural diplomacy if you take it in the real sense it doesn't depend on a culture it depends on the eternal truths of life for example there is an eternal truth of existence that this universe is made of five great elements that is the space which provides space for everything air which flows everything there is a fire or you can call it you know light or sun or whatever name you give then there is a water and there is earth these are the five great elements these are you know accepted truths now you can divide water into different oxygen hydrogen you can divide gases into you know five different gases you can divide earth into different uh, minerals uh, this iron there is gold there is silver there is uranium this and that that division you can do but grossly for a general human being we can explain properly that this whole physical world is made of these five gross elements which is a truth now this is a science this is nothing to do with Uh, spirituality it has nothing to do with any religion the, the the greeks also said the same thing the indians also said the same thing i suppose the other civilizations might have said this so this is the truth we also say that the body go, comes from these panch tattvas and goes back to panch tattva that's what we say in india <coughs> now it is nothing to do with hinduism it's a truth of the uh, Uh, of the of our existence it's a eternal truth similarly there are eternal truths which exist in the world so we should devote ourselves to eternal truths not to the things which are uh, you know blindly believe don't believe anything blind whichever book tells you whatever it may be you have to uh, test the truth of that thing that's statement so don't believe anything blindly this is what i would say the real test lies that whatever is told to you by any book or by any uh, writer or any spiritual text you should test it yourself think about it you have been given uh, thinking power you have been given intellect in your system apply those things test it if you find it good then accept it otherwise don't accept it so it is a science it is not the dominance of one religion or another religion buddha did not said buddhism is my religion it the follower of buddha who came out with buddhism buddha never said that this is the, he only reiterated certain truths of life which he experienced and he said those gandhi you know came out with certain truths of life maybe nelson mandela came out with different truths of life maybe george washington came out with some other truths of life 
maybe jesus christ with came out with some other truths of life so there are multiple truths of life which have been propagated by different uh, individuals uh, throughout the history of uh, human civilization and therefore we should test those statements and truths and then believe if we find they are good you believe if you don't find they are not good don't believe that's what i would say there is no question of dominance of anything it's entirely based on uh, that that examination and the test uh, evolved by you for those things but don't be biased keep your mind open uh, i give an example of a mirror for example there is a mirror in front of you if it is a concave mirror or convex mirror it will not give you a correct image of yourself or if it is covered with dust it will not give you a correct image of it so the mirror should be clean so your mind should be objective it should not be partial against or for something else if you have already decided certain thing in your mind as right and wrong then you can never get the right picture so you should keep the mind open and then examine the things properly then you will come to the right conclusions so i will say that examine everything and then come to a conclusion thank you ambassador gupta uh, moving on to the next question during the nehru period indian foreign policy was centered on idealism buddhism and gandhian ideology with the particular emphasis on buddhist principles such as peaceful coexistence and non violence to what extent was indian uh, india's foreign policy successful during the cold war era particularly in the nehru era by adhering to the buddhist principles in its diplomatic approach you see principles depend on the context there are two things in life there are absolute truths and there are relative truths relative truths depends on the context the understanding of the people in a given situation for example first time when i went to europe and i visited a beach i found that you know the picnic clad women i found it was ridiculous why should they do this why can't they wear proper clothing and sit down there that was my there is a contextual thing you see and the same thing you do it in saudi arabia it will be you will be imprisoned immediately so it is a it is a truth but it's a contextual truth in europe they do it in saudi arabia they don't do it in india it's the middle way some people do it some people don't do it this is how it is but you feel hungry whether you are indian whether you are american whether you are in europe whether in india you will feel hungry that is it eternal truth you feel sleepy wherever you are whether you are american citizen indian citizen you know living in india living in america living in antarctica doesn't matter that is an eternal truth so there is a difference between contextual truth and eternal truth now that you should distinguish based on uh, practical experience of life the eternal truths are applicable everywhere the contextual truth are required to live in a particular place in a particular time in india we have this uh, concept called days and kal days is the place and kal is the time there are certain things which are valid in a particular country at a particular time but uh, they are not essentially eternal other things are eternal they they exist irrespective of time and place so that is the difference we have to make uh, between the two now the nehru's policy or uh, the policy of non violence or for example non alignment uh, was valid in that context of time that time when they were you know world was divided between cold war between uh, soviet union that time and uh, america on the other side so that policy was useful today the context has changed and therefore we have this policy called multi alignment you align with one country for one thing you align with another country for another thing so the multi alignment looks better today than non alignment and you know there are different approaches every country has its own approach certain countries still believe in alignment 
okay we are aligned to x country for all the time like nato countries they want to remain allied in a nato alliance some people don't want to remain allied in a particular alliance they want to be free and i believe that we should be free we should decide on merit what is good for the country what is good for the world what is good for the people of the world and that should guide our policy and it depends on the context we are living in so the foreign policy cannot be uh, eternally true it's contextual based what is true today could be wrong tomorrow and what is true in india could be wrong in russia or could be wrong in america this is contextual these are no eternal principles there these are all contextual principles which will keep changing so i think that time that policy was serving its purpose but today multi alignment is perhaps a much better option than non alignment thank you ambassador gupta um, moving on to the next question i think this would be the last i suppose now <laughs> yes yes ambassador gupta yes okay um uh, yes uh, so uh, actually yeah so in what ways can cultural diplomacy aid in integrating isolated groups such as those residing in the north sentinel islands into the broader fabric of indian society you see as far as india is concerned i would say there is a thread in india which runs through from north to south and east to west which connects all the people in some way and that thread is not uh, isolating anybody but there are certain differences because of local practices which have happened partly because some people as we call them adivasi some people who have remained uh, confined to a particular area with practical uh, you know with particular uh, uh, habits and customs for a very long time they have remained in that form i think we have to we should not try to integrate everybody in one uniform culture uh, as i remember if everybody is eating the same food everybody is you know wearing the similar clothes if everybody is uh, using a similar kind of transport then the the world will not look very interesting it will become absolutely you know boring the 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 multiple practices the different practices the different cultural traditions the different languages they give a, a different meaning to the life they provide uh, what you call uh, a very fascinating picture of human life so this is how the it should be built so we should actually allow them like for example today in latin america i can tell you about mexico where i served or some other parts there were about 70 80 different languages they were all disappeared they speak only one language the different cultures they were all synthesized into one now that uniformity should not happen what we call coca colaization of the world that everybody start drinking coca cola everybody behaves you find the same shops in the airport everywhere in the world now that is not the world is designed for every human being is a different entity i can be identified on the basis of my fingertip or on the basis of my iris so i am a very different entity than you are each one of you are a different person so why do we try to make them uniform i think let us live a different uh, a life as we have been uh, given a different perspective by uh, by our birth itself a different talent somebody wants to be a good sportsman somebody is a good musician somebody is a good entrepreneur somebody is a scientist somebody is an educationist if everybody is only a scientist then what will be the fun in living a life tell me you need a person who can cook and a person who can uh, teach you yoga you need another person who can play football you need third person who can entertain you with music next person who can make a film you know you need variety in the life so there is no need to synthesize people 
we should speak different languages we should have different customs cultures and we should preserve those customs and cultures this is the heritage of the uh, of the humanity and i think we should not try to invade them and bring them into one single uh, uniform culture that is not the idea and that is not understood in fact unesco is the one which uh, try to preserve the what you call uh, you know different cultures and different practices around the world so i would suggest that let us not try to synthesize and uh, bring uniform culture anywhere in the world let us live uh, in different styles of life different customs it gives uh, much more fun it gives lot of spices it gives you lot of interest in life otherwise you will become very boring if you do the same thing in and out and everybody does the same thing in and out thank you ambassador gauri shankar gupta for being here today with us we had a successful discussion on today's theme culture diplomacy present and future scenario i found your perspectives on this topic highly interesting and informative the purpose of this conversation was to discuss the present and future scenarios of cultural diplomacy as the world grows and changes the need for cultural diplomacy is becoming more important than ever everyone benefits from interactions and communications with other cultures and understanding different perspectives without cultural understanding there would be no tolerance and acceptance among people cultural diplomacy should be a global priority for governments and other entities involved in facilitating cross cultural communication and exchange cultural diplomacy involves promoting culture and raising awareness about cultural diversity around the world this promotes peace and understanding between different cultures and prevents conflicts there are many different ways that countries can conduct cultural diplomacy to promote their cultures this could include visiting other countries to learn about their cultures holding cultural events to showcase different cultures or promoting their cultures through social, uh, social media and other forms of media i believe that cultural diplomacy has great potential for the future the world is becoming more and more interconnected and people need to interact with each other to learn about other cultures and help promote peace around the world i am confident that cultural diplomacy will continue to play an important role in shaping the future of the society thank you so much for your time today uh, ambassador gauri shankar gupta and i look forward to seeing you again soon i would also like to thank everyone for attending today's special talk on the theme of cultural diplomacy present and future scenario as a part of the international diploma course on diplomacy and indian foreign policy i hope you all had a great experience thank you so much thank you so much dr kamakshi vasan it has been a pleasure to be with you again